I'm going to continue now from still in chapter 1. Well, last time we talked about how the Greeks like Thales and Pythagoras uh, generalized rules that they learned from other cultures into abstract mathematics. I talked about Thales' similar triangles and today I'll talk about, I won't talk about Pythagoras' theorem which he, he learned the special case of the 3-4-5 triangle being a right angle and he generalized it to this triangle uh, that if this triangle is a right triangle then this general rule is held and he gave a proof of that it was a very demonstration proof okay it wasn't really what we would call an analytic proof okay that was that came later from Euclid but the, den the interesting part about his demonstration proof it's based on rotation symmetry now what I want to talk about more uh, is Pythagoras's second insight okay and his second insight of course, side of course was that nature is not only um, beautiful we talked about nature being beautiful but we'll also he also had this other insight that nature is mathematical okay so nature is mathematical what does he mean by that he meant that we, we studied certain mathematical symmetries and you can find a correspondence for these mathematical symmetries in nature and we'll talk about a few examples but what it taught him and what he should teach you is that physicists are always on the lookout for mathematical symmetries and mathematical patterns in the behavior of nature and when we find some mathematical pattern then we can understand how the different phenomena are related so how did he come to this very um, wonderful realization well it turns out that it was around him and he was just very observant okay so in particular his father was a jeweler and so he, he saw these wonderful gems all the time in the shop right and the gems were never perfect okay the gems you know w w looked like this and they always had flaws and so on but Pythagoras saw beyond these flaws to think that indeed there must be some generalized perfect solids that will always be the most beautiful okay so uh, so a particular gem would have a correspondence in this particular what he called perfect solid which is called the tetrahedron or another solid which is more familiar to you which is called the cube and the octahedron and the dodecahedron and the icosahedron okay he actually didn't come up with this guy this guy came later but nevertheless he and his successors realized that there are certain perfect solids that you can form out of perfect figures and by perfect figures I mean that all of the sides are, are equilateral triangles or all of the sides are squares okay or all of the sides are pentagons and so on so you can construct these and it turns out something that Plato later on recognized is that you can have five and only five solids and Plato jumped to this great um, let's say guess that the reason that you have five perfect solids is because you have five elements and so there's you know correspondence between five elements and five solids well that wasn't right okay but nevertheless uh, there is a mathematical proof that you can have five and only five perfect solids and that mathematical proof was also later on given by Euclid okay so the the lesson over here is that you can find these forms in nature they're not perfect when you dig them out of the mine you know you have to perfect them you know so you carve them or you 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 have a, a jeweler who cuts them to make them perfect and the more symmetric you make them the more beautiful they look okay and so there this is what you mean by nature is beautiful okay you pay more for it if it's got more symmetry to it right <clears throat> um, let me move this fellow out of the way crystal symmetry points to atomic nature of matter this is really a realization that came to full force way later okay like 1900s right that people realize that the reason that you have crystal structures is because they are made up these perfect crystals are made up of atoms and these 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 gems for example the barrel is a hexagon and a salt crystal is a square and so on and these crystals build up by orderly stacking like you have oranges in a supermarket or something when you stack them in an orderly fashion you find form a nice pattern and that's what happens to the atoms the atoms are individual 
and when, you, when nature stacks them up, you get the crystal structure. Now, Pythagoras didn't understand this, okay? This came much later. Uh, but what did come rather early is the idea that matter is made up of atoms, okay? And that came almost a, just, only a generation after Pythagoras. Uh, but again, not because of uh, the person, not because he recognized this relationship, but for a different reason which we'll talk about. Uh, but I wanted to point out, the person who recognized that matter must be made up of atoms was a guy by the name of Democritus. And he came one generation after Pythagoras. And we'll talk a little bit about him <clears throat> and about his ideas. So let me talk a little bit more about other mathematical patterns that Pythagoras recognized in nature. Okay? So the, the, the one interesting pattern that is so obvious, but you, know, you don't... You don't you don't uh, focus on it in your observations of nature. So you're, you're sitting here on the surface of the earth, and certainly you always see that when you drop a stone, it falls in a straight line, it falls down in a straight line. And if you think about the earth as a sphere, like Pythagoras had guessed that the earth is a sphere, then the straight line on which a stone falls down is what you would call the vertical. Okay? And then there's another straight line that you, is very obvious to you in nature, and that other straight line is the horizon. Okay, this is a modern painting. And this shows very nicely the horizon. And so there's a nice relationship between the vertical line that goes to the center of the earth and the horizon. The horizon is where the sky meets the earth. Okay, that's the horizontal line. In fact, the word horizontal comes from horizon. Okay, so the, the angle between the vertical and the horizon where vertical is defined by the direction of free fall, that angle, which Pythagoras recognized, is a right angle. Okay? And since Pythagoras was very fascinated by right angles, that was his uh, famous theorem, right angle, he recognized this right angle between these two directions is important to organize space. He recognized another aspect about space that, is, uh, that we use to organize, and that is that our familiar directions of north, east, west, south, okay, these are related by the right angle over here. Remember now that these directions of north and east and west and south are really independent directions that are connected to astronomy. And we'll talk more about how these directions became defined when we talk about astronomical phenomenon. So north became defined by virtue of the north star uh, and east by the virtue of where the sun rises, but not where the sun rises every day but where the sun rises precisely during equinox. Do you, know what, do you know what day is equinox? The next equinox, when will it be? March, March 21st will be the equinox. Okay? There's another equinox, uh, which is called the autumnal equinox, which is September 23rd. So where the sun rises on those days is east, exact east, and where the sun sets is exact west. Okay? And the north star, by the way, determines the north, and the north star is those stars around which all the other stars rotate. Okay? And we'll see that. And the north star doesn't move. Okay? <clears throat> so these directions of north, east, west, and south are connected again by a right angle, tri right angle which is what Pythagoras realized. Okay? <clears throat> so we'll do more on this when we turn to the heavens. All right. Now I'm going to talk about a much more juicy in uh, connection between nature and mathematical patterns that was recognized by Pythagoras. See, Pythagoras was very observant, like, you know, he saw his father's jewels in the, in the shop and so on, and he saw the pattern. And he, you know, music was uh, important to every culture, and he recognized an important mathematical pattern about music, which is what I'm going to try to demonstrate to you by some of these musical instruments over here. But I've made some very simple musical instruments. Those people who, how many people play the guitar here, or the violin? Okay, we've got a couple of violinists. Okay, so please forgive me for simplifying the music in a very simple way, okay? <clears throat> um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you the mathematical patterns that Pythagoras recognized. So I have two strings here, which are stretched tightly between these two bridges, and the distance between the two bridges is 100 centimeters or one meter, okay? So this, this ruler here shows one meter length, okay? And I'm going to lay it down over here between these two bridges. And so I've made myself a musical note. Can you hear it? And, and now if I have another string, which is exactly the same length, it'll also make the same musical note. 
So I have two musical notes that are identical, okay? And because they are the same length. So now what Pythagoras recognized is that if I take this string, the second string, and I cut it in half, okay? So if I do something like shown in the picture over here, I take one string and I cut it in half, then this second string makes a different musical note than the first string. But there's a relationship between the two musical notes. Okay, so let me put this uh, bridge in here, and let me put this um, <coughs> this marker over here, and I think that's halfway over here. You see, there's 50, 50 centimeters. Okay, so now I've made myself a different musical note, but there's a relationship between this note and this note. In fact, my musicians will say they're the same note. Right? They're the same pitch. Sorry, they're a different pitch, but the same musical note. For example, if this was a C, this is also a C. Okay? And then the two are related because this is half the length of the other one. These two are related by what we would call an octave. Okay? An octave. So the, if you have two musical notes created by two strings, which are an octave apart, then the lengths of the two strings form this ratio of two to one, 100 to 50. 2 to 1. Okay, so a simple mathematical relationship. And the sounds that they make are pleasant to the ear when they're made together. So, okay, because when you play two notes that are, that are an octave apart, then you make a pleasant sound. I'm going to try to be a violinist, okay, with the bow. And you can play them together. And that makes a pleasant sound, okay? All right. Now, that it's a bit boring, okay, you're playing the same note. So, of course, uh, Pythagoras and musicians around him were familiar with the fact that they're more interesting notes, and so I'm going to make you a more interesting note by dividing the second string not into one half, but into two thirds. So, two thirds of a hundred is 66.6, .6, okay? So, I'm going to move this um, <clears throat> guy to 66.7. So, 60 is here, 65, 66, 66.7 over here. And now I've got two-thirds, one-third, and one, okay? So now if you hear the note, they're still pleasant, and this note is also pleasant, okay? The one-third is also pleasant, and I can play, okay, I can play, I can play nice music, okay? Now. <laughs> not very interesting music, but more interesting than the octaves, right? Because what I've made is a, what, what uh, my musicians will recognize is I've made a fifth, a perfect fifth. A fifth, by the way, is a very common interval in music. You know, a lot of famous, a lot of musicians, classical musicians, like to end their piece on the fifth, you know? Not, not Beethoven's fifth, but they end their piece on the fifth as, as a ah, sound of finality and completion, okay? So that has this uh, nice feature to it. But Pythagoras' point was that these two notes, these two notes, either you make them octave or, or, or fifth, form a pleasant sound, form a harmony, okay? And you can also, I'm not going to do this, but you can also make it three quarters and one quarter, and that will also make a nice harmony, which is called a, a, a perfect fourth, and you can play all these notes together to make pleasant music. But if you do not take a nice ratio, nice simple ratio, like 2 to 1, or 3 to 2, or 4 to 3, if you take a nasty ratio like 62 to 63, all right, then you won't get a nice sound. Okay, and I'll do that for you. So I'll take this uh, 60 here, and I'll move it down here a little bit. And now I'll play these two notes together. And it's not so pleasant, right? Unless those people who love Stravinsky, you know, will, will, find, will find these two notes to be somewhat discordant. You know, compared to what I had before, these, these notes here were much more uh, pleasant chord. And so if you, make, if you make a ratio that is not a ratio of simple numbers, then you still get a musical chord, but that musical chord is not harmonious. And so what, to, to summarize what Pythagoras recognized is that pleasant, harmonious music composed, is composed of ratios 
of simple rational numbers. Okay, simple rational numbers. <clears throat> so that was a very important connection that he determined between mathematics and nature, nature being uh, music. Okay? And if you are familiar with the way we write music, these notes here are an octave apart, okay? and, um, and then these notes over here on, on, the, musical, uh, on the, uh, of the musical score, this is your, your perfect fifth, and this one over here is your fourth. Okay? <clears throat> so simple ratios of whole numbers make harmony. In fact, the idea that nature is rational can be traced back to this notion, okay, that the, the Pythagoras attached to ratios of whole numbers. And in fact, he believed that everything in the universe can be explained by simple whole numbers. So when people uh, who followed him believed in the virtue of these perfect numbers, and anybody who contradicted him was thrown out of his brotherhood. Okay, so they believed the, that the importance of rational uh, numbers. And again, uh, repeat the, the mathematical relationship and the musical notation of these musical intervals. <clears throat> now, another important factor to realize is that this mathematical relationship in music does not depend on the fact that you have strings. So, for example, if you have bells, again, there's a mathematical relationship between the size of these bells and the notes. So you have the same relationship as in the strings, or you can have glasses full of water, or you can have flutes instead of just the strings. So over here I have for you uh, wine glasses full of water, and I'm going to play you the musical, assuming that uh, I'm successful. Uh, you guys have all had this, uh, this entertainment. You entertain your parents, right? I'm going to have to be real quiet. You hear that, right? Just barely? All right, so now I'm going to play. You see, the, 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 the length of the water column has this mathematical relationship to each other. Unfortunately, I didn't have a good enough glass to give you the next highest note, so I had to uh, choose a different glass altogether. But basically, I'm trying to say is that there's a mathematical relationship between these lengths. It's not as simple as this one, because the shape of the glass is complicated. Okay? Uh, but the music here... Or I can play you a little song. It's not very loud. <laughs> we'll try it again. My, knee, my finger needs to be wet. And then if I had more, I could play the rest of it. <laughs> what, what, what was that? Did that make any sense? What was that? What song was that? Mary had a little lamb. <laughs> no, come on. It's a French song. Thank you. <laughs> So when you're in the when you're in church, you know you should you should pay attention to the sermon and so on. But take a gander at the organ sometimes <clears throat> in the church that plays the beautiful music, <clears throat> and you'll recognize that the the lengths of the organ pipes have a mathematical relationship to each other as the musical notes are harmonious or uh, and so on. Okay. So this is a a, a very a uh, standard example, and one of your assignments later on in the semester is to go down to the science center and interact with many different experiments that they have, and one of the things that you will find is making musical notes with different organ pipes uh, over there, so you can, you can interact with yourself. So Pythagoras then jumped to this notion that all is number, and what he meant by that was that the simplicity and the beauty of natural numbers is present not only in music, but in nature everywhere. And for us, what this means is that 
Pythagoras had appreciated a very deep analogy that the language of mathematics provides a mirror for the physical world. I'm going to give you more interesting examples than this Pythagoras ratio examples in a minute. But you'll see that I'll, I'll give you examples now from vegetables and fruits, and I'll give you examples from nautical shells now, but later on I'll give you examples from the periodic table of chemical elements and the new elements, quarks and leptons, as to where you see mathematical patterns in nature, just like Pythagoras saw in music. So let's look at the world of flowers and fruits, let's say. So when you look at this flower, what's this called? Sunflower or daisy? Daisy, sorry. Okay. So when you look at the daisy, uh, you see a nice symmetry, and you see that the, 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 the what, do you call, what are these called, pods or something inside the center of the flower, these form a nice pattern. And there's something mesmerizing about that pattern. You know, there, are, there is beauty and there's symmetry in here. And there's a mathematical pattern in here, which you will, you will appreciate when you look at the clockwise pattern here. And also there's an anti-clockwise uh, arrangement of the parts. If you stare at it long enough, you'll see that some of these go anti-clockwise. And so you can count for a particular flower, you can count how many clockwise patterns and how many anti-clockwise patterns you have. And in fact, you can look at different uh, vegetation. For example, here is a pine cone, and here is a pineapple, and so on. And if you go and count the clockwise spirals and the counterclockwise spirals, you find that in the pine cone, it's five clockwise and eight counterclockwise. And in the pineapple, it's a little harder to see. When the next, next time you buy a pineapple, start counting. Yeah? So 8 and 13. And now this is a more complicated flower here. I forget what it's called. There's 13 and 21. That one is 21 and 34. And then this finally is 55 and 89. Interesting numbers, right? But what does it mean, these numbers? Uh, so if I put these numbers together, then you see the numbers are 5, 8, 8, 13, 21, 34. Uh, now I know the names of these plants. <laughs> um, and we're 55, 30, 89. So if I put them in order, I get 5, 8, 13, 21, 34, 55, 89. It's not as easy to get the mathematical pattern as for the musical notes, but does somebody understand the mathematical pattern that you're seeing here? Fibonacci, right? There's a Fibonacci series here. But what's the relationship between, uh, how do you get the term 13, for example? 5 and 8. And the way you get 89 is you add 34 and 55. So every term in the Fibonacci series is the sum of the previous two. That's how you generate the series. And nature needs this, this organization pattern, or demonstrates this organization pattern. And if you go deeper into the reason for Fibonacci patterns in nature, you'll realize that it's a consequence of a competition between the growth of the plant and its uh, ability to try to maximize its uh, resources. For example, maximize the receipt of sunlight. So the competition between space, so it's just exactly next to, the, to, to its predecessor, then it's, it's tightening up in space, but it won't receive as much light as it would if it spreads out a bit. So it's a competition between those two that gives you this this natural pattern, the Fibonacci series, which was discovered by this 13th century uh, mathematician uh, when uh, he, he looked at uh, natural growth. And he also uh, realized that this pattern uh, is something that comes out of population growth of, uh, uh, for example, a colony of rabbits. And so this guy Fibonacci, by the way, was actually much more famous uh, for another discovery uh, which he brought to Europe, another discovery, then the Fibonacci series, and that was the discovery of writing numbers in our alpha, uh, in our Arabic way. Okay? So uh, before Fibonacci, people just wrote the numbers in the Roman way, you know, the, the Roman numerals. And Fibonacci, in his travels to, uh, to uh, Egypt, and, uh, in his travels to, uh, I discovered, this is back to in the 13th century, that the Arabs, who had learned from the Hindus, had a much better way of writing numbers, and he brought that to Europe. So ever since Fibonacci, we've used these uh, uh, alphanumeric characters to, uh, to describe 
the number system. <clears throat> so that's his most famous discovery. So Pythagoras, uh, to finish up then, Pythagoras uh, had, had started to look at nature in a new way, right? And different from Thales. Remember how Thales looked at nature in terms of the flat earth floating in water and the hemispherical canopy, and Pythagoras was talking about the beautiful spherical universe, which he couldn't see, but nevertheless he said it's there. Um, and this approach, or this difference, this argument between Thales and Pythagoras then grew as Greek culture developed, it grew into a contentious debate between the philosophers who came after him, after them. And that was the debate again, between reason versus observation, on which is the better path to growing our understanding of nature. Do we use reason or do we use observation? And I'll give you examples uh, here as to <clears throat> uh, what are the problems with each method and what are the advantages of each method. So, uh, a generation after Pythagoras, another philosopher by the name of Parmenides, he raised an important issue which reflects on this concern as to how can we reach uh, proper conclusions about nature? How can we come to scientific understanding about important questions like what is the correct shape of the earth? Is it round? Is it flat? And what are really the constituents of matter, these elements? Are these really the elements or is it something else? <clears throat> and he criticized two methods of looking at nature that his predecessors had used. And he looked at the pros and cons of these two methods. So in one method, we make observations about the world with our senses, senses like Thales did, about looking at the flat earth and the hemispherical universe. Or you can use the power of reason or symmetry or the power of uh, rational analysis as we, in as we do in geometry, which Pythagoras had emphasized. And Parmenides said, if you consider these two ways, he said, the second way is superior. It's better. And the reason he said that the second way is superior is because he realized that with the first method, there can be a serious flaw. And the serious flaw is that whenever we make an observation, we, can, we have to rely on how accurate our senses are. So you can think of various examples. And the most famous example is you, know, you have three beakers of water. One is hot, one is cold, and one is lukewarm. And you put your finger in the hot water, and you put your finger in the cold water. right? And then you take your two fingers and immediately put them in the lukewarm water. Well, this finger is going to feel cold, and this finger is going to feel hot. So now what, the lukewarm water is what? Hot or is it cold? So how do you rely on your senses you have to give you the correct answer? So, so but, uh, Parmenides said, in order to make observations, one uses our senses, and therefore one has to rely on the accuracy of the senses, and senses are full of errors. And I give you one example. I'm going to give you another example of why senses are full of errors. So I'm going to show you a picture for two seconds, and I want you to shout out as loudly as possible what you see. And then I'm going to take the picture away, okay? All right, so here's the picture. <clears throat> shout, shout! Oh, wait a minute. Somebody said angels. Somebody said bats. So what do you see? Bats. And somebody says angels. See, it all depends on how you look at it. <clears throat> There's angels, right? But look at the blacks. Look at the black figures. Focus on the black figures, yeah? Focus on this head. Focus on this black head and this wing. Yeah? There's bats and angels. <clears throat> so so in your book, there is the fish and birds, right? So it's, it's another one. This, by the way, is a <clears throat> famous technique of M.C. Escher, who is a very famous uh, modern artist. So it's a modern, book of modern art where Escher is trying to, to challenge you, okay? He's sort of taking the same approach as Parmenides. But Escher goes a little further, okay? Escher is trying to say, with his paintings, that you have to think about what you see. You know, what happens is that you get used to looking at the world in a certain way when you use your senses. You always look at the world and you say, it's flat, it's flat, it's flat, it's flat. And then somebody comes around and says, no, the world is round. And you say, how can that be? Yeah, later on, I'll say that your clock should be different from her clock. And you'll say, how can that be? Right? But that's how Einstein figured it out. Right? He looked at the world in a different way, in a certain way. And so what you need to learn from this ex exercise here, from this course, is that 
we need to be open. We need to open our minds to looking at the world in different ways. Okay? And what Esher is trying to do is he's trying to shake you up by jolting your reality, okay? the reality of your perceptions. And this is exactly the example that I gave you before, namely Thales is cosmology based strongly on what he saw versus, our, versus Pythagoras' is cosmology based strongly on what he thought. Now I'm going to come to one of Parmenides' students, very famous student, his name was Democritus. Okay? And Democritus was the guy who came up first with the idea of atoms. Okay? And what he was trying to do was he was saying there's a tremendous amount of diversity in the substances of the world that you see and there's change. Okay? You can see that moisture uh, in the atmosphere becomes water, which becomes ice. And because of all of these changes and because of all the different appearances, what is eternal in the substances of nature? What is unchanging, underlying this variety that we see? And so he came up with the idea that, you know, that, that and again, I want to emphasize that he came up this, with this idea through pure thought. Okay? <clears throat> and the idea was that if you took anything like water and you divided it, or earth, and you divided it and divided it and divided it, then ultimately you would reach some, sub, some portion that is no further divisible, okay? uncuttable. You cannot divide it any further. And he called that atomos. And that's where our word atoms comes from. Okay? Now the atom, what he considered to be the ultimate constituent of matter, must also be unchangeable. Okay? Because once, if you can change it, then it's not the atom, because you can cut it further or you can change it. So how then does this theory explain what he started it, namely his question about the diversity of natural phenomena and the diversity of the substances that we see? How did this theory of atoms explain that? Well, the theory of atoms was that every substance that we see is really a cluster of the atoms already formed. And when we see substances change from one to another, it is the clusters that come apart and come back together, and when you have diff different clusters, you have different substances. Now how do clusters of atoms okay, undergo this change? Well then he needed to introduce two new properties about atoms that are really fantastic, which is true by the way, in our modern realization. He said that these atoms are not just there, they're kind of moving around all the time. Okay? And not only are they moving around all the time, but they're moving around in a vacuum in an absence of all matter. Okay. So he created the idea of no matter, absence of matter, that the atoms are there, that they're moving around, and because they can move around, because of their incessant motion, they can detach from, one each, uh, from clusters and attach into new clusters, and that's how you get one substance to become another substance. And so Democritus created these wonderful ideas of atoms and empty space and motion and congregation of atoms, all through pure thought. Okay, all through the method of Parmenides. Atoms, motion, and void, way back you know, in the 600, 500 BC. In fact, this was his famous quote, nothing exists except atoms in motion through empty space. Everything else is opinion. Right? So that uh, he certainly was well taught by his master Parmenides. He did not need to see the discreteness of matter or their motion. Okay? So today, how many of you think that we can see atoms with our present modern day instruments? Raise your hands if you think we can see atoms today. Skeptics. <laughs> All right. Uh, so only two or three people think that we can actually visualize atoms today. Well, I'll show you later in this lecture. The answer is yes, we can. Oh, not, not the Obama thing, okay? All right. We can, we can see... We, we can see atoms, all right? And I'll show you the picture of atoms as they look today. <clears throat> all right, now I'm going to move on to a, um, a uh, an, a, another phase in the, in the advancement of Greek culture, where this early debate between reason and observation <clears throat> evolved further and took on more interesting forms under new thinkers who came at the time of what we call the golden age of Greece. <clears throat> they pushed our understanding of nature further. And this golden age of Greece came at the time uh, when Greece was being threatened by the Persians uh, and they defeated the Persians in a major battle, which I won't go into because that's for a course in history. But then after this victory, 
the Greece, the Greek islands became, you know, they came together and uh, they, they flourished enormously and they became very rich. And in fact, they became the most beautiful, Athens became the most beautiful and rich city of all the Greek islands. And it in fact became the cultural center of the Greek world. And many ideas were born here that we are now, uh, we owe them these ideas. They are in fact the nucleus <clears throat> of our Western culture and some of our Western values. Okay. <clears throat> And so what, and, and in, in addition to ideas, they had many accomplishments, architectural and otherwise. So if you go to Athens today, the main site to see is the Acropolis, where you have this, the ruins of this temple over here, the Parthenon. And the, the, the statue of Athena stood over there in the middle of the Parthenon. But at the time <coughs> when Athens <coughs> was in all its glory, you had all of these other temples and then people would, you know, walk up to the most, uh, the highest temple and, and uh, praise, uh, praise all the different gods that they had. And the, the, the important uh, point over here is that the Greeks in this golden age made these Im Im uh, important advances in architecture and in the way in which uh, they expressed their, their ideas. <clears throat> so not only did you have the architectures, but you also had poets and philosophers, who we will talk about, mostly the philosophers. Now, I want to pause over here to show you another mathematical uh, property that the architects used that's based on, say, the face of the Parthenon. <clears throat> and the reason I'm going to pause over here is because it's connected to the Fibonacci series that I talked about. <clears throat> Interesting enough, Fibonacci discovered his stuff in 1200. Okay? Now, here's this Greek architect where he makes a proportion for the face of the Parthenon <clears throat> temple in this wonderful uh, geometry which by the Greeks called the golden rectangle. <clears throat> so it's a rectangle which has got a long side and a short side but when you have a particular ratio of the long side to the short side that's called the golden mean. And the way that in which the architects of Greeks arrived at this beautiful golden rectangle, perhaps it even looks something like this, uh, this golden rectangle, is they said, suppose you had a square, right, with side one and side one. Well, the square is kind of boring. Everything's equal. So let's take, instead of, instead of making my, my temple face a square, let me make it more interesting. So what they did was they divided one side in half, okay, and then they took this point with a halfway point and they drew a diagonal from here, not a diagonal, but they drew a line from that halfway point to the corner. And then if you use Pythagoras' theorem, remember, if this is a half and this is one, and you do the sum of the squares, then you come up with this side to be square root of 5 over 2, right? You can do the math uh, privately, okay, 1 plus 5 over 2. Then you take this line and you lie it down, okay? Then once you lie this line down, you get what we call the golden rectangle. And so the long side in the golden rectangle is half plus half plus root 5 over 2, so 1 plus root 5 over 2, okay, that's what you get for the long side, and the short side is 1. So this is the ratio of the long side over the short side of the golden rectangle. Wonderful. So they came up with this nice, uh, nice ratio that they liked very much, which they call the golden mean or the golden rectangle. So the ratio of the long side divided by the short side equals 1 plus root 5 over 2 equals this number 1.618, which I want you to remember for a second. Now, <clears throat> what you will see in section is that this mathematics of the golden rectangle comes about many, many times. And so what I just showed you as the ratio of the long side over the short side is actually also the ratio of the long side plus the short side over the long side. So if you work this out, in order for this relationship to be true, again, you will need the long side over the short side to be this number, which, by the way, turns out to be the Fibonacci ratio. So I'm now going to give you another example from life forms which is connected to the Fibonacci numbers and the, the, um, the uh, golden rectangle. So you see this beautiful nautical shell that has this mesmerizing spiral. And if you look and ask, what is the mathematical pattern behind this, uh, this beautiful uh, sea life, what you see is that you can draw a rectangle first to, to capture the figure. And that, by the way, turns out to be a golden rectangle. Okay. Namely, the, its long side over short side is one over square is one plus root five over two. Now, what? 
how do you generate the spiral? Okay, is is very interesting. A property of the golden rectangle is that if you take the short side, right? If you take the short side and you make a square out of it and you put that aside, so you color it blue, what you're left with is another rectangle. Turns out it's also a golden rectangle. Okay? So if you take this golden rectangle and you make it into a square, you get left with another golden rectangle. And you take this golden rectangle, you make it into a square, you get another golden rectangle, and another one, and another one, and so on, ad infinitum. Now here comes the shell. If I draw now an arc on each one of these squares, okay? Oops, sir. All right? If I just keep drawing this arc, I get this mesmerizing spiral. So the mathematics of the way the spiral grows is related to the golden uh, rectangle, which is, by the way, related to the Fibonacci series, which I will let you figure out later on. <clears throat> All right, let me come back now to this development in the golden age. Another manifestation of this development was the establishment of the first university of Western civilization. As I said, they, in fact, founded the roots of many aspects of our culture. So the fact that we have universities like Cornell here was the idea and, the, and that we are an academic institution. All of that idea came from the Greeks. In fact, the guy Plato founded this academy uh, near the Acropolis in Athens, and he called it the academy after his friend Academus. <clears throat> and he, he emphasized on educating the oligarchy of Greek, namely the, all the rich guys, uh, uh, to be leaders of Greece, and he taught them mathematics and philosophy and ethics and so on. <clears throat> and he promoted debate, arguing with each other, and he promoted the democratization of knowledge, namely the whole idea of a university. And it turned out that his academy, the Plato's Academy, remained a very strong center for a thousand years through the rise and fall of the Roman Empire and other cultures to follow, it, became, it, it stayed as the center of education and the center of intellectual activities. <clears throat> now, I, liked, I like this particular painting. Of a later Renaissance artist whose name is Raphael, uh, where he draws, and he actually calls this painting, the Academy of Athens. Okay? <clears throat> and... I like this painting because it juxtaposes many movements of Greek culture together in one picture, even though those different movements took place at different times. So here, if, we, if I focus on this side of the painting, he's got a group of philosophers uh, that are discussing the nature of the heavens and the earth. Okay, this guy, by the way, is uh, Apollonius, and this guy is... Uh, are, um, Ptolemy, um, but who came much later, and uh, the Greek the Greek artists like to paint themselves into their pictures, yeah, a little bit like Alfred Hitchcock likes to you know make a cameo role in one in his movies. So this is Raphael, this is his his art teacher, <clears throat> and I wanted to emphasize this particular uh, painting. In fact, I made it the cover of the book, right? I put it on the cover of the book if you happen to notice, uh, because of the idea that they would debate, they, they stressed how important it was to have free thinking and talk to each other and debate to each other. That's why I want you to go at each other's ideas in section and you know, try, try to discuss with each other uh, the value of promoting knowledge through reason versus observation. Now Plato introduced another idea into development of scientific thought, which I like to call idealism. So, even though Plato himself did not advance science, in other words, he didn't make a great scientific discovery like Pythagoras or Thales did, he did introduce this, some very important ideas, like debate, uh, 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 the importance of debate, and this idealism was one of his, his, his key, his, his key in, uh, emphasis. And this was actually a continuation of the philosophical path that was set by Parmenides, one of his predecessors. Now, you know, when you, when you learn about this in uh, philosophy classes or in, uh, in, in other courses, you kind of get a version of it that sounds very trivial and sounds a little bit like 
Plato was off the mark. Okay? So the version that you get is everything that we observe, namely reality, is a mere shadow of the real world. In fact, there's this famous story of, uh, you know, the, that we are all like uh, uh, prisoners in a cave, yeah? and uh, all we see are shadows of the world on the, sh on the wall of the cave, and we never see the real world. So well, that, that, that was the idea. Okay? Now, <clears throat> what he's trying to say is that what we see, what we observe, are only imitations of the real thing. Okay? So again, back to Pythagoras, you have to look beyond what you see. Okay? So to give another very trivial example, but still very deep in meaning, okay? so let's look at a circle. Okay? We, you know, we can easily explain what a circle is by drawing a circle on the sand. Okay? And, but what you do, what you draw, what you make, are only imperfect copies of a real circle. Okay? The, what, what we're really interested in is not in what you draw on the sand, but we're interested in the idea of a circle. Okay? So the geometric forms are really idealizations of what we can make. So we can certainly make, um, we can certainly make this picture okay, of a circle. But no matter how accurately we make it, with a pencil, with a compass, etc., this will never be a perfect circle. Okay? What we nearly have to try to understand is what is a perfect circle? What is an ideal? It exists. Okay? A perfect circle exists. Everybody knows what it is. But you can never realize it in the real world. Because every circle you make is imperfect in some way. Okay? Your pencil has got a little thickness, your hands shake, you, know, you make a hole in the middle, your hole gets dislodged, etc. So your circle, no matter how accurately you try to make it, is never perfect. But if I ask you, what is a circle? You all know exactly what it is, and you all can define it, and it's perfect, and it's ideal. What is it? What is a circle? You, you're in there, but if I ask you, to, if I just say 360 degrees, then uh, how, do I, how, do I, how do I picture the circle in my head through this idea of 360 degrees? Okay, I, I'll start you off. A circle is a collection of points equidistant from another point. Okay? Perfect. You cannot beat that. Right? That's a perfect definition of circle. Right? You could even say the idea of a point is, is an ideal. Okay? So the idealization is that even though you draw the figure with the compass, it's not a circle, it's a shadow of a circle. But when you define it like you just did, a set of all points that are equidistant from the center, then you have the idea of a perfect circle and that's what is important. And so the idealization is what we use to go beyond the world of experience to the new province of ideas. Okay? And it is idealizations which allow you to separate the complexity of nature, you know, the, the, the wobbling pencil and the hole of the, of the compass that's imperfect, allows you to separate all that and reach the underlying universal principle. And it is by such thinking that you reach ideas like the spherical universe, the spherical earth, and the existence of atoms. Right? It's by such thinking that you reach that. So, this, so, so Plato, even though many scientists really hate Plato because he didn't really make any progress in science, Plato really introduced this important idea of how you make progress with thought. Okay? Now idealism turned out to be an important component of Greek culture in other ways. So <clears throat> you can see higher forms. You know, Plato, in fact, introduced the idea to his university, to his students, and he taught the elite pupils of his students how to behave according to ideal principles. Okay? Principles which we call today ethics. You know, ethics comes from the heavenly word ether. Okay? Behave, behave according to the principles of heaven. And so those principles like equality and justice. Do you see equality and justice in the world? In the real world? Do you see it? No. But you know it's there, right? You know you have to strive towards this. That's what the ideal is. So he taught his, his students these ideals. And today we say, okay, these are the ideals that light up the world. Okay? We, our country, for example, pursues these ideals, at least tries to pursue these ideals. And we hope that other countries in the world will, will, will understand what we are trying to do. All right. So these ideas may not actually exist in all real politicians, but they eventually come out, come out okay? and, or, in, or in all real governments. But that's what we strive for when we try to 
to uh, arrive at a government that we know and we, that we love. Okay? So Plato's stresses on idealism was not a singular trend. It was manifest in, in the politics of the time, uh, in the architecture of the time, in, in, the, uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the way that they constructed the temples. So for example, they built all these temples in Acropolis. Okay? Acropolis is a high city. Okay? That's what it means, Acropolis. And when the uh, sculptors made these sculptures of artists, they didn't focus so much on what the, what the um, you know, if you've got high definition TV, you say, oh, I can see all the little moles and hairs and so on. But before you had high definition TV, you know, you would look at the, at, at the character and just see the character and the story and so on. Okay? So they ignore all the details that you would see in high definition, but the idea of what the athlete is in terms of his composure, his stance, okay, his strength, those are the things that they, they expressed in the sculpture uh, of, and the ideal aspects of that sculpture. That's what was uh, emphasized. Okay? So the Greek artist represented the ideal man or the ideal woman, and he ignored the details. <clears throat> All right. So now I'm going to give you your second question. Uh, um, Plato's teacher was actually this guy Socrates. Right? And this painting here... Uh, tells a story about Socrates' death. Right? How many people know the story about Socrates' death? How did he die? He drank hemlock, so he committed suicide, right? Okay, uh, and, and uh, I, will, I will leave you then the question. Why does Plato's teacher point up? Okay. <clears throat> so, the correct answer is... <clears throat> uh, what the hell is the correct answer? C, I think. Yeah, okay. So, let me mark it correct. Um, so what's going on here is... The reason why Socrates is... Actually, Socrates was condemned to death by the politicians of the time because he was teaching on the street and corrupting the, moral, corrupting the morals of the young people telling them to think for themselves instead of following the, the laws and the rules. Uh, and so he was brought to trial and convicted and he was offered, since he was such a very uh, powerful figure, he was offered the chance to go into exile. Okay? And <clears throat> he said, no, if the law is determined that I should die, then I will die for my principle." Because the law is superior to my life. Okay? So the ideal is the law. And the law must be obeyed. This is the important part of our society. Right? That we must follow the law no matter what. Because otherwise society will fall apart. So he is pointing upwards to stick to his high ideals. Right? <clears throat> so you got that. All right. Now Plato's student, most brilliant student, one of his most brilliant students, actually the most brilliant student, was this guy by the name of Aristotle. Okay? <clears throat> And Aristotle, after all, you know, Plato taught his students to think for themselves. And Aristotle took that example to heart and he said, Plato, you're wrong. Okay? He emphasized, contradicting his master, he emphasized the value of observations. Okay? <clears throat> so contrary to his teacher, Aristotle believed that to gain insight into the natural world, Creative hypothesis and reason are needed. Okay, he, in fact, used it. But they are insufficient. Okay? It's important to gather evidence. Okay? It's important to make observations and to gather the evidence. And today, we call that empiricism. Okay? Empirical content is very important for science. And Aristotle, by the way, uh, himself made very, very important observations in many fields, including biology. And here's a nice picture of Aristotle making observations on marine life on his honeymoon. Okay? So he ignored his wife and started to study the starfish. Okay? <clears throat> and so Aristotle, by the way, turned out to be a competent biologist. And his works on biology uh, turn out to be still quite relevant compared to his works on physics, which have all been dismissed as good thinking but wrong, wrong answers. So here again is my famous, famous painting of Raphael's. Uh, painted in the Renaissance, where I showed you this group of thinkers here, and now I show you this group of thinkers.
and one of them is Plato and one of them is Aristotle. So which one is Plato and which one is Aristotle? So who's this guy? Plato. Why do you pick him to be Plato? Huh? Because he's older. <laughs> All right. Good. But look at the ideas. What, why is why is Raphael? What has Raphael painted about Plato that tells you that he's Plato? He's pointing up, right? Why is he pointing up? He's emphasizing ideals, okay, like his master, okay. And this guy Aristotle is pointing down, okay. So Aris, sorry, Plato emphasizes the importance of reason and higher ideal principles, whereas Aristotle gestures downwards to the importance of the physical world, stressing that it's important to pay attention to the tangible evidence around us. So now he comes back to this great insight of Pythagoras, namely that the earth must be round. Okay? And he shows that through careful observation and interpretation, there is a proof that the earth must be round. And so he says it's not enough to just speculate on the basis of symmetry and cosmological principles. He says, where is the evidence that the earth is round? Okay? In the old days, they had this commercial of this lady running around saying, where's the beef? Where's the beef? Okay? So Aristotle said, where's the beef? Okay? That, the, that the world is round. And he comes up with this beautiful statement in his work that the sphericity of the earth is proved by the evidence of the senses because the lunar eclipses would not take on this form unless the earth was round. So what's happening here is this picture of the lunar eclipse and by looking at this picture of the lunar eclipse it turns out that Aristotle could determine that the earth must be round. Okay? Now we'll go through that in, in, in a bit more detail now but first before I do that let me try to ask you what is a solar eclipse? Okay, that was a lunar eclipse. This is a solar eclipse. Okay? It's a little bit easier to start by a solar eclipse. So what is a solar eclipse? So stop and display and the answer is the moon comes between the earth and the sun. Okay? So everything is visible. Okay? So here you are on earth and you're looking at the sun, right? And the moon comes between your vision and the sun. So the sun starts to appear eaten up. Okay? It looks like it's cut. Now, why am, I sh why am I focusing on this right now? Because you can see that the moon is round, right? You can look at it with the eye and say the moon is round. And when you see the solar eclipse, you see the shape in which the sun gets cut and you say, aha, when a round object comes in front of the sun, it gives you this kind of a shape. So now you can see that if you have a solar eclipse, first you will have the sun illuminating the moon, right? The sun illuminates the moon and then the earth comes between the moon and the sun, which means that the earth casts its shadow on the moon. So now if I'm walking around the ground and you see my shadow and you say, look, that's my shape. So when you see the shadow of the earth on the moon, you say, that's the shape of the earth. Right? You, see, you can see your own shadow. So when he says, if this shadow has a curved part to it, then this is the shadow of the earth. And that means the earth is round. Okay? It turned out, by the way, that last semester we had exactly at almost this time a perfect lunar eclipse, okay? And all the students got to see the example of it. So look, at, look up on the web when the next lunar eclipse will be, see if you get a chance to see it. Now he had another proof. Uh, as I said, Aristotle collected with, uh, observations from people and he focused on observations. So another observation that he collected was that sailors who traveled you know, on, on, uh, on, the, on their uh, colonizing expeditions and so on, they would write down that as they traveled far north, that they would see new constellations in the heavens that they'd never seen before in Greece. He says, wow, if you live on a flat earth and you go from one place in the flat earth to another place in the flat earth and you see stars, you should see the same stars from here as you see from here. So why do these sailors report always that they see new constellations when they go to new parts of the earth? He says, aha, that the reason is because the earth is not flat but the earth is curved. And so when they go from Greece to France, let's say, or the, uh, uh, the border, the, the Mediterranean Ocean there, when they are here near Greece, this is the horizon. This is where Pythagoras has shown the horizon here. And so they can only see stuff above the horizon, which means they can see these stars. But when they travel north, the horizon changes because the earth is round. 
Right? So now this is the new horizon, which means that these stars that were not visible to this guy are now visible to this guy. Okay? So new stars are visible, proves that the Earth is round. And then, of course, you have the standard proof that the, the ship, when you look at the ship, and it goes away, first goes the hull, then goes the mast. Or say, oh, my, my ship is sunk. But no, the ship comes back. Right? So the ship is not sunk. Okay? And the reason you see that is because the Earth is round. <clears throat> so these, these are the observations. All right. So in my last five minutes now, I want to give you some modern updates. Every chapter, as I said, has a modern update. Okay, so I'm going to give you some modern update to show you that in this quest to understand the universe, okay, the ancient thinkers were no less creative than those of scientific minds today. <clears throat> so when we look at uh, the, the gems that fascinated Pythagoras, and we look at their crystal structure, and we say, you know, the snow crystals are beautiful, uh, a beautiful hex, uh, hex, hexagonal symmetry. Why is that? The reason is that the water molecule has hydrogen, hydrogen, and oxygen, and the way that these atoms have arranged themselves is in this nice little triangular pattern, so that when you have steam, these molecules are very far from each other, and they don't make any pattern, and when they get closer to each other, they catch some, uh, some of the neighbors together and they make water, but when they get really close to each other, they are forced to go into a pattern because of the structure of the individual molecule. And that pattern is a hexagon. And that hexagon symmetry is reflected in the symmetry of the crystal. Okay, so the hexagonal symmetry of the snow crystal is really an expression of this, the triangular symmetry here of the steam. Okay? Uh, in fact, if you look at carbon, which is a very familiar element, if we look at carbon, depending on how the carbon atoms are arranging themselves, you can get all kinds of beautiful things. For example, you can get graphite, which is what you use for number two pencil. Okay, that's graphite. Useless stuff. I mean, not useless stuff, but pretty cheap stuff. But if you put carbon under tremendous pressure, you can form this structure, which is diamond, which is very precious, but it's pure carbon. Okay? And then if you put it in this structure, which was discovered 20, 30 years ago, which is called the buckyball, and it has some very interesting, fascinating properties. Okay. Now I'm going to talk about the answer to the question, can we see atoms today? That is a picture of the surface of a crystal of iron, I think. Where each little mound that you see is an atom of iron. Okay, so these are a visualization of the atoms of iron all lined up. And how do we see this? How do we make this picture? Where we did this picture, with an instrument called the Scanning Tunneling Microscope. Okay? Now, there's a very simple principle on this picture. <clears throat> so if you have a crystal or an object that you're trying to visualize, what you do is you make a needle, and the needle is very sharp. So sharp that its tip can be one or two atoms thick. Okay, so there's the tip of the needle. And you connect, you bring the needle closer, close to your surface, and you connect a battery between the needle and the surface you're looking at. You put this in a vacuum, okay? So when you connect the battery, uh, uh, and you bring the needle close to the surface, an electric current flows from the surface to the, to the needle because of the battery. Now what you do is you try to keep this current constant and you move this needle back and forth across the surface. Now, when you do that, when you get close to the tip, you've got to move away. And when you are in this hollow, you've got to go in to keep the current the same. So the needle basically bounces up and down the structure, okay, because it's only an atom wide, in order to keep the current the same. And how the needle moves up and down is a picture of the atomic nature of the surface. So here you are. We visualize the atomic picture Okay, uh, with, with, with the scanning tunneling microscope. Now I want to show you another one which is very, very interesting, and then uh, you can go. You can actually not only make a picture of atoms, but you can actually manipulate individual atoms. So here is a picture of atoms made by a scientist at IBM, which is called the Atomic Man. And here's another picture of atoms made by a Japanese scientist who didn't want to be uh, shown off. Okay, so when you get a chance, you can go down to the. Go down to. We have a facility here on campus. Okay, called the Nano 
fabrication facility. You can take a tour there and you can ask them to write your name in atoms. 